Good morning. My name is Brooks Barron. I am the Minister for Environmental Justice at the United Church of Christ, which has its national offices in downtown Cleveland. Welcome to all of you on this beautiful Earth Day. We may be locked down physically, but let us be liberated in spirit, if I may sound churchy for a moment. 50 years ago, Cleveland was an epicenter of, of change as the response to the burning of the Cuyahoga River rippled outward, leading to the first Earth Day, the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, and the passing of the Clean Water Act. Today, Cleveland is still an epicenter of change, and we are fortunate to have four featured guests for this town hall who will stimulate our minds and lift our spirits as we broaden and deepen our commitment to caring for this common home of ours. The plan for the next hour is to begin with Senator Brown, who I'll introduce shortly. We'll then have three featured guests before we move into Q&A and then a final closing call to action. And so without further ado, let me introduce Senator Sherrod Brown, who requires little introduction as he is well known throughout Ohio and the country. His journey has taken him from a family farm in Mansfield, Ohio to a life of public service that includes time as a member of the Ohio General Assembly, as Ohio's Secretary of State, and then as a US representative for the 13th District before becoming a senator in 2007. Throughout his tenure, he has served with conscious concern for matters of social, economic, and environmental justice. Senator, we understand that your time is limited today because of pressing concerns, the pressing concerns facing our nation, but we recognize your joining with us as a steadfast commitment to continually engaging the people of Ohio. We are delighted to have you with us on this day. The floor is yours. Moderator today by Reverend Barrows. I'm, I'm, I'm her. You can hear me, right? Yeah, okay, okay. There's a piece in the Plain Dealer today. Uh, city can lead on virus as it did with Cleaning River. And um, thank you. It talks about a Green New Deal, talks about a lot of things that that we should all be thinking about as people who care about justice and care about economic justice and environmental justice and, and civil rights. So thank you for your leadership uh, with, uh, with, the, with UCC. And uh, my wife and I were married at, uh, at a UCC church at the Mother Church in the west side, near, near west side of Cleveland. So um, thanks, I understand there's several hundred people in this call. Thank you for joining us. I wanna start out with a, with a story that that um, might, in the spirit of talking with a man, the picture I see on the on the screen, a, a, a pastor with his collar, uh, which I assume you're not wearing all the time, but I'm glad you are today. I don't have one of those. I just have a shirt. But um, I want to tell you a story that I, at the time, 50 years ago today, uh, April 22nd, 1970, it was a Wednesday night. I was a senior at Mansfield Senior High School. And two friends and I thought, now this, this tells me will tell you, as you see this hear the story, how little I knew about politics and I knew even less about community organizing. So um, two friends and I, John Todd and Paul McLean, Paul still lives in Mansfield, John has moved elsewhere, uh, decided we were gonna do a big Earth Day rally. So we organized at our school. We had, it was a Wednesday night, it was a school night. Uh, I was a senior that year and we marched down, we, we met at, at um, around my church, St. Luke's Lutheran Church at the right at the corner of Bowman Street and Sturgis and Park Avenue and Marion Avenue. Uh, we, we had 700 people that marched and we were, we were pretty pleased with ourselves that we were able to get 700, mostly students marching um, for our first Earth Day celebration. But none of us had planned on what we did after the march. So we got to the city square and we didn't have any speakers. We didn't have any, micro, we didn't have any microphones. We didn't have anybody to speak. And I remember we looked at each other and said, what do we do now? Nobody figured out that when you do a march, you ought to have like rally and speakers. So that showed how far I had to go to, uh, in any way, my career figuring this out. But that was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, um, April 22nd, 1970. Uh, it's been marked every year by many of you and thank you for that. 
um, this year is the 50th anniversary. It's especially important. And one of the things here that the environmental movement has evolved into is really understanding the importance of the environment and how it affects people's lives. And we know when we look at health disparities in this country, we know the environment has a whole lot to do with that. Uh, the high concentrations of the, the zip code Connie and I live in in Cleveland, 44105, our zip code in, 19, in 2007 had more foreclosures than any zip code in the United States of America in the first half of that year. Um, and I still see that devastation. And that devastation also has a whole lot to do with that, that devastation has a huge impact on people's health. Uh, the, 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 the homes in our neighborhood, so many homes in our neighborhood have toxic levels of lead. Neither the landlords or the owners of the homes have the financial resources to clean those homes up the way that we should, to paint them over, to remove the lead, whichever method, um, however far they go in, in fixing this up. And we know that uh, we know in this neighborhood and neighborhoods like this, uh, the, the, the rate of asthma is higher, the rate of diabetes is higher, there's increased exposure uh, to contaminated air and contaminated water and frankly contaminated soil that kids play in where there might have been a foundry or there is uh, all the things that happen there. Um, so that, that's, that's what our mission is in, in Earth Day is, is to fight for people for environmental justice and economic justice. Uh, uh, Dr. King said that the, the, the history doesn't, the pro progress in history doesn't, let's say it again, history doesn't roll in on the wheels, progress doesn't roll in on the wheels of inevitability. Progress doesn't roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It's up to us to make it happen. And that means rededicating ourselves, even with an administration in Washington that is so taken us back, backwards from the progress we made, what this president and his administration has done on, on, on mileage standards for automobile fleets, what it's done on clean air laws and clean water laws. Even in the midst of this pandemic, the administration's found the time to surge forward on going after environmental rules that had been in many cases by, often advanced by President Obama, but often advanced by both parties, the kind of environmental progress they've made. So um, we need your engagement. We need you, you to stay involved, whether it's the mercury and air toxins rule or clean car stand, clean, clean car standards or uh, anything else that matters during this awful pandemic. And I, I am hopeful, I'm always hopeful, but I am especially hopeful that come next year when this virus is mostly, if not entirely, probably not, mostly in the rear view mirror, that we really try a restart when it comes to the environment, a restart when it comes to economic justice, a restart when it comes to, uh, to, to health disparities. We, we owe that uh, to our future. We know that young people are, are particularly discouraged now because coming out of school, high school or college or community college, the job prospects look pretty bleak for them. Many of them who are in their 30s can look back 10 years and see those the, that, that same devastation for the economy. This one is likely worse. Um, we need to especially look out for young people, but always engaging in civil rights and economic justice and environmental justice. So Reverend Byrne, thank you. And thanks for the dedication of your church. Um, thank you for the work that, that so many of you are doing uh, in your communities. Thank you for the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition, which is part of this call. Thank you to the Sierra Club and all of you for stepping up and um, uh, sometimes out of your comfort zones and, and doing what so matters for the future of our country. Uh, thanks for having me for a few minutes today. Well, thank you. We greatly appreciate your spending some time today and your busy schedule. It is a delight to have those words from you. And uh, we, we really appreciate all that you are doing at this time. Thanks. We'll now transition to our uh, three next panelists who I'll introduce now in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, first up, we have Michelle Mann, who is the Assistant Director of Nursing Practice with the National Nurses United. NNU is the nation's largest professional association and union of registered nurse, nurses in the United States. Michelle works with nurses across the country, providing education and guidance as they work together to protect their practice and advocate for patients. In the Cleveland area, she has a well-deserved reputation as a passionate and vocal advocate for justice. 
Following Michelle, we will hear from Yvanka Hall, who is the executive director of the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. She received a Master of Public Administration from Texas Southern University. She is a published author with her story included in the making of a public health emergency and the book, Not Far From Me, Stories of Opiates and Ohio. Her work in addressing health disparities has been recognized by Congress. She speaks all over the country about effectively engaging African-American communities in the Cleveland area. We have witnessed her as a master of engagement on a number of causes, including the struggle to protect children from lead poisoning. And then our final guest speaker today will be Darcy Friedman, who is the Swetland Professor of Environmental Health Sciences and the Director of the, of the Mary Ann Swetland Center for Environmental Health at Case Western Reserves University's School of Medicine. Dr. Friedman's research agenda is focused on the interplay between the environment and human health with a focus on the role of food systems as a driver of population health. She received the 2016 Sarah Samuels Memorial Award by the American Public Health Association in recognition of her contributions to advocacy policy and evaluation for public health nutrition. She served as co-chair for the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Policy Coalition from 2017 to 2019. There you have the introductions for our speakers and now we will turn first to Michelle. Go ahead, Michelle. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for being here today as we talk about Earth Day. And um, specifically, uh, uh, I'm going to share with you just a few things uh, about uh, Cleveland. I have a brief presentation that I put together um, for, for us today. Um, so just bear with me one second. We've got, um, we know here, uh, today. Um, so we're talking today about uh, Earth Day in Cleveland, and I wanted to bring a little historical context here. Uh, clearly, we're in the midst of an epic crisis, right? Uh, but the, in every crisis is opportunity. And I wanted to link together just a little bit more clearly the threat of climate change uh, to our health. Uh, we know uh, this is one of the major threats to our health. Um, in fact, in Ohio specifically, uh, we're seeing it uh, profoundly, just as an example, affecting our children. Uh, one in five Ohioans are uh, with Lyme disease are children. Six Ohio cities are the most challenging places to live with asthma. And um, short-term exposure to pollution um, exacerbates mental health disorders in children. So we can see uh, we're actually damaging our potential for our future uh, by, by failing to address this very important public health issue. Um, the links as we think about our current situation with COVID-19 and an unprecedented modern global pandemic and environmental and other social issues is, um, is inextricable. Uh, we know that we had Ebola outbreaks that were coincided with forest deforestation and hurricanes in Puerto Rico caused massive global shortages of essential drugs. Human migration uh, caused by climate crisis increases the risks of infectious diseases. So while we're in the midst of a pandemic, uh, we can uh, unfortunately predict future ones. Um, there are some important uh, social justice histories to learn uh, from our past. Uh, yellow fever, those plagues were caused by the mosquito that was brought into the United States via slave trade and uh, resurfaced uh, and were used uh, as a narrative uh, in so-called immunity to yellow fever, used as a narrative to uh, further entrench, entrench justification for slavery. Um, believe it or not, they, they claim that African Americans were immune to a yellow fever without any evidence. The work around uh, connecting public health with um, 
environment and other uh, determinants of health is actually goes well beyond um, the past 50 years. Uh, Cleveland, as part of the International Settle Settlement House Movement, would, had a very robust community organizing centers, which were formed by nurses and social workers. Uh, many of these uh, names may sound to you familiar even still today. Um, university settlements, Playhouse Settlement, uh, Glidden House, Hannah House, these were all the community organizing hubs uh, that were started through the Settlement House movement. Uh, the recognition was that community-based organizing was vital to, uh, to link together all of these various determinants of health. Uh, they were organizing hubs for labor organizing, anti-poverty, uh, fighting uh, to address industrial pollution, providing healthcare uh, and education. However, unfortunately, we've seen over the past uh, century that these public health initiatives, so uh, this is basically the settlement house movement was the foundation for public health, um, has been commodified. Uh, so our life, our health, uh, just like anything in a capitalist society, uh, if it can be commodified, it will be. And as sure enough, uh, we've seen all of these various elements uh, that once were um, organic community organizing hubs eventually turn into our hospitals and now into a vast industrial complex. And the reason uh, this is important here is because it really plays uh, a very vital role to recognize that the commodification of our health and our life is really at a, uh, we are at a pivotal moment in history of our country. Um, and exemplary of this is one of the fights that we have as nurses for personal protective equipment. Uh, this epidemic, this pandemic is not a surprise to nurses. And we have been fighting for these kinds of infectious disease protections for over a decade. However, this industry um, we, seeks to uh, model after the manufacturing model and doesn't uh, like to invest anything proactively. COVID-19 has demonstrated uh, the huge systemic problems in our healthcare system and public health, um, not just in our failure to plan, but also our failure to provide um, actual healthcare. This crisis has provided cover to this massive industry to implement a disaster capitalism uh, agenda where they can continue to further commodify our lives and our health. Um, nurses, uh, unfortunately are living this out in our basic fight for protective equipment. Um, in the face of this massive pandemic, a recent report shows it's not just a lack of availability of protective equipment, not just a lack of planning, a lack of investment, but active lobbying of the US Chamber of Commerce with companies like 3M and Honeywell, who are fighting against the invocation of the Defense Production Act, which we use regularly in the United States to produce this PPE, because they don't want to have any types of limitations or restrictions. And many of you in the, in the various movements, whether it's for racial justice, um, environmental justice, uh, uh, you're familiar with the bad actors um, in industry, um, particularly the chamber, uh, who lobbies uh, on behalf of industry um, in their un unfair labor practices and uh, in general uh, to put industry needs above the needs of people, profit before life. We are in an unprecedented era here um, because we have this immense opportunity. We've seen the power uh, in all of the push to reopen the country, so to speak. Um, we know that it's really not being predicated upon our safety, uh, but rather it's this get back to work that there are some things more important than life and that is capital and the production of it. And so we're entering a phase where we're really potentially um, treading into um, unfortunately historical and potentially future um, dangers. These dangers are um, really uh, this 
uh, manifest not just in our fight for PPE, our fight for healthcare, our fight against disaster capitalism policies, such as banning immigration, uh, xenophobia, and all of the various things that are uh, stem from this kind of crisis. Uh, what we're seeing a lot of now as nurses that I feel it's important to talk about in this moment is this notion of antibody testing and the dark legacy that it has and how it's potentially can be used and why we need to focus on this uh, in this crisis uh, together. Um, all of our struggles are interlinked and this is another example. We see antibody testing uh, being rolled out widespread across the country. We were warned as nurses from our colleagues around the world about the nefarious use of antibody testing um, in restarting uh, the uh, economic engine. We've seen already in a lot of literature uh, from academic institutions, as well as um, in the common press, that antibody testing could be a pathway starting first testing healthcare workers and other essential healthcare workers. In other words, the folks that we're relying upon to keep our economy going. Uh, this is a largely women, largely people of color workforce. Um, and so putting these folks uh, at the front of this uh, line is potentially dangerous. It's important to know that the presence of antibodies does not mean immunity. And we don't know how long these antibodies might last. Uh, in MERS, we don't, they only lasted 10 months. So this is a fictional premise as of today used to place workers at risk. We're hearing uh, that if we have to ration PPE or put people out to work, that it's best to do, do it with those who have antibodies, even though we don't have any evidence whatsoever that this is protective in any way. And so we're already seeing the kinds of uh, disparities uh, amongst the working class, uh, poor people of color in this crisis. And we're potentially going into yet another phase uh, because this, uh, as a nation, we don't really want to invest in the public health uh, measures that are necessary. So I think on this Earth Day, when we think about the interconnectedness of our life and our health, we have an opportunity to recognize that historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between the one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice um, and our bad ideas, or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine a new world and ready to fight for it. And uh, as nurses, as advocates for public health, as advocates for the protection of our future, of imagining a better world and all of the continuation of our working class struggle, um, we are prepared to defend our health and our life uh, together, uh, linking all of these things. We must recognize that this is a working class struggle um, and we can uh, build the power necessary to re-envision, re-imagine and demand a better future. As nurses, we are asking you in this moment to stand with us in our demands for protection, not only for ourselves, but for all essential workers. Uh, please join us in our call to Congress uh, and sign our petition at protectnurses.org. Also, when I'm done here, I will put a link in the comments to a more in-depth discussion of antibody testing and issue briefs. So thank you all for being here uh, in this very important moment on Earth Day, Earth Day. Uh, and having this solidarity uh, together. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, thank for you. that vitally needed perspective on the plight of workers and the plight of nurses and during this pandemic period. We'll now transition to Yvanka Hall. Ivanka. Hi. Um, Michelle, I want to thank you and I want to thank NNU for the work that you all are doing, um, particularly the protests that have been taking place um, across the country. Um, for us, it is important to have people who are on the front lines and understand the particular needs of their communities. Um, and so for me, um, I run the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition and the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition is the first coalition in the state of Ohio 
to focus exclusively on African-American um, disparities in education, employment, housing, and health. I actually work, have some members of my team, a medical geographer, which is Dr. Lachelle Pugh, who's out of Youngstown. I have a sociologist on this part of my team, Dr. Anisi Daniel-Smith, who's actually working at the University of Mississippi. I have lawyers, doctors, activists, and community members that are all involved and engaged in um, the work that we're currently doing. So I, I think I have to go back and say that 50 years ago um, in 1970, when Earth Day was launched, it gave voice to an emerging, emerging public conscience about the state of our planet. Um, it inspired some 20 million Americans to take to the streets, parks, auditoriums to demonstrate about um, against 150 years of industrial impact. Um, but for my community, for the African-American community, poverty and pollution have been a non-priority. Earth Day today, like 50 years ago, has mostly ignored the plight of poor people. What COVID-19 has done was shine the light on the social determinants of health and the problem of systemic issues centered around access, accountability, and racism in education, employment, housing, and health. We can no longer jaw jab about all the great things that have been done for Black people while stepping over the bodies in the street. African Americans have more of the circumstances that make it harder to survive this pandemic. Deep-rooted poverty, pre-existing medical conditions, um, less access to health care, less stable employment, lack of transportation, and racial se segregation are all factors that contribute to the pandemic's um, disparate impact on African-American communities. COVID-19 is impacting African-Americans disproportionately because of the comorbidities related to poverty and racism, exposing existing inequities in our healthcare system, in our educational system, in our judicial system, employment, and our social system. So our systems are failing our communities. COVID-19 is not choosing Blacks as victims, rather the deadly virus is highlighting the disparities that existed before its emergence. Disparities related to COVID-19 highlight the need for in interventions to mitigate the effect of the disease um, on Blacks in Northeast Ohio. The loss of life due to COVID-19 has a greater effect on minorities and results in greater loss of life. So one of the things that we will talk about is the years of potential life loss. Um, in the African-American community, what we're looking at now is more than 12 years um, and half a, a trillion dollars in their years of potential life um, from um, dying early from this virus. So we're looking at people who are about 55 years old, um, their work life, they still had 20 more years left into their work life and now they're gone. And so I, I thank Dr. Lachelle Pugh um, for working on that piece, which we'll actually be sending out later today. Um, a larger number of Blacks are employed in essential jobs, as Michelle talked about early, um, that increase the risk of exposure. Um, our examples include um, custodians, healthcare workers, um, personal care workers, food service workers, delivery services, grocery cashiers, and numerous other job functions. Personal protection equipment um, is essential to safeguarding the health of essential workers. Um, these important workers should be protected as they fulfill their needed functions. So as they're um, working to fulfill a need that we have, we have to make sure that they are also protected. They are on the front lines also. Um, thus lessening the risk of putting themselves and their family members at risk because they also, at the end of the day, have to go home to their families. Um, as Dr. Kamara Jones, a well-known African-American physician, researcher, and public health advocate recently put it, COVID is unmasking the deep disinvestment in our communities. Um, as we are talking about the environment, we can't help but over, can't overlook the issues of what food insecurity means um, that some families or individuals may only be able to buy enough food for a few days, resulting in more frequent shopping trips and increasing their risk of contact with the virus. Access to nutritious food is important to keeping families healthy. Um, our school systems have to meet the nutritional needs of students in a different way, including utilizing buses to take food to students in their district. Currently, the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition has been working on a nutrition program for students who are disabled and taking the food to them. On Sunday, on this past Sunday, 
we deliver more than 1,500 lunches and snacks for the next two weeks for our families that we're working with. Um, many students are being raised by guardians who are at a higher risk, who are usually their grandparents, who are at a higher risk for infection for the virus. We have to do everything that we can to ensure that our school systems do not put caregivers at risk by forcing our caregivers to have to go to school sites in order to get food for the students that they're taking care of. Um, Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition's review of recent lab confirmed COVID-19 cases in Cuyahoga County show that even without race ethnicity data included in the findings, the impact on the African-American community is at a comparatively high rate. Simply put, social disparities impact Black lives more. Um, African-Americans are exhibiting exponentially higher rates of disease, disability, and death than non-Blacks. Reason for the disparity include the presence of chronic disease, food insecurity, and employment in essential jobs. Individuals with chronic disease may have serious complications that result in hospitalizations and even death. Failing to recognize and document the racialized social factors that contribute to these rates of illness are another example of a quiet, systemic, and deliberative process that continue to disproportionately affect minority populations. Nothing just happens, including the patterns of illness and death that we are currently witnessing. Increased testing is necessary to identify the extent of the disease in the population to allow for identification of areas where intervention will mitigate the effects of the disease. Knowing which areas of the community are experiencing high rates of cases and higher percentage of at-risk populations will determine where to concentrate efforts. Um, the data drives the dollars. Intervention strategies must be driven by the data to ensure that the most efficient use of resources. Um, the rollback of environmental policies have made life in urban America an obstacle course that includes dodging poor air quality, lack of green space, lead paint, which as you know, our rates in Cleveland are twice as high as Flint, Michigan, and four children test positive and are still testing positive every single day for lead. We are demolishing buildings without following EPA wetted standards, putting residents without, within a three mile radius on a clear day at risk. But what happens when the wind blows? Um, the saying is that when white America gets a cold, black America gets pneumonia. African-Americans have proven to be resilient and strong in the face of incredible odds but the ultimate outcomes of even the most resilient are never assured when the starting point is so close to the edge of the cliff that a tremendous fall is surely imminent. This is an environmental crisis with deadly consequences. Today, I join with others from Cleveland and from the Cleveland area in marking the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Cleveland was an epicenter of change 50 years ago. And as the current Earth Day coalition coalition so eloquently states, the coronavirus is symptomatic of the biodiversity and climate crisis, um, a pandemic of our making. Will we, civil society, government, business, learn any lessons this time around? Will we reevaluate what is important? Will we be innovative and find solutions to the current drivers of destruction? Or will we see a return to business as normal after the medical crisis that are sweeping across the planet of base. Surely that would be unforgivable. The Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition understands the importance of cultural competency during this time because cultural competency looks at systems and our desire to ensure that cultural proficiency becomes the norm. Um, cultural proficiency understands how people work because in the end, the African-American community will continue to suffer the ill effects of unjust environmental policies and practices from a wider community that has failed to recognize the inequities. It is so important for us from this day forth to work together on the issues that are disproportionately impacting us. We must take action. Um, Dr. King died before Earth Day movement was established, but his work shined a light on the very things that we talk about today. 
Um, I know that on May the 17th, we'll be recognizing No Menthol Sunday because of the mass targeting of African-American youth. And so it's important for us to understand these movements within movements and how they disproportionately impact our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Yavaka, for giving us that moral lens and focus and sense of urgency to address the multiple crises before us now. We will transition to hearing Darcy now. Darcy, we can't hear you. Let me make sure you're unmuted, sorry. I'll, I'll click the unmute button for you. You're good. Okay, you hear me? I have to have it on my phone. Hello. We're getting uh, feedback from your phone, I think. It might help if you... Uh... Okay, I hung up my phone, but I have had some connection issues because of my kids homeschooling while I'm working and our web connection can be a little bit shaky, but Hopefully we'll be okay. Um, so I just wanted to say good morning and thank you for inviting me to join this important conversation commemorating the 50 year anniversary of Earth Day. And I wanna give a special thank you to Brooks for organizing the virtual forum and to my fellow panelists for your commitment to sustaining well into the future, the unquantifiable beauty and benefits provided by Mother Earth. When Brooks asked me to present today, he offered several topics for a focal point and I decided to share some thoughts on a vision for environmental justice, given the focus of the Sweatland Center's research, training and community engagement on finding and scaling solutions for health equity, in particular environmental health equity. As I think about Earth Day, it brings to mind the need for both celebration and action. Over the past five weeks, celebrating the wonder of our earth has been the one source of escape through walks around my neighborhood, listening to and often laughing at the geese as they were honking last week at, at what seemed to be in madness at the snowfall or playing choose your own adventure at each guidepost as I hike through one of our great metro parks. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this. This time of celebration is becoming a family affair and each week my kids select the next natural resource to experience. And a common theme in visiting these parks is the presence of water. There are streams and creeks and ponds and lakes and they all offer serenity as we hear the slow dripping of water. And they also are the perfect resting spot to skip rocks. My 10 year old son had nine skips this past week at Big Creek Reservation indeed a homeschooling lesson in skills not taught as easily in the classroom. And we imagine warmer days when we put our feet in the water, splashing and playing under the sun. Yet I find my mind quickly shifting to the question, is this water safe? As we skipped rocks this past weekend, we started to talk about the cues you can use to judge the safety of water. And I told my son that I wasn't as worried about the stuff you see, like the plastic bags and the cigarette butts and the wrappers and containers. Of course, I'd prefer not to see these. However, I am much more worried about the stuff you cannot see in the water. This distinction between the stuff we more easily see, like race, as my colleagues have pointed out, reflected through shades of skin color, and the stuff that is much harder to see in black and white, like racism, which is what I really think was pointed out, 
reflected in who has access to parks and green space, clean water and air, fresh and healthy foods, and the ability to socially distance. And this shifts my focus to the importance of action as we prepare for the next 50 years of sustainability and environmental justice. COVID-19, as we've heard, is a stage light on well-known inequities that structure society in a manner such that the goods and benefits are not fairly distributed. A CDC report on COVID-19 hospitalizations in March 2020 found African-Americans were disproportionately represented. We've seen this pattern revealed in headlines in cities like Detroit and Milwaukee and closer to home in Marion County, Ohio. In the CDC report, among people ages 18 to 64 who were hospitalized because of COVID-19, obesity was the most common underlying condition. We know that obesity rates in the United States are highest among non-Hispanic Blacks, and obesity rates decrease with increasing education levels. People with lower education levels may be less likely to hold jobs that allow for working from home. A report by the U.S. Department of Agriculture found low-income and racial and ethnic minority Americans with fair access to fresh and healthy foods. One of the great lessons offered by Mother Earth is our interdependence and adaptability. Many of us have played the game where we take a ball of yarn and we pass it around a circle. And this creates a connected web such that moving two steps back results in tensions for others around the circle. Similarly, our current responses to COVID-19 such as how school districts offer differing supports for homeschooling, adds new tensions to the web of environmental justice. A team of researchers and partners at the Marianne Swetland Center are working in collaboration with the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Food Policy Coalition. And we've been working to dive deeper into the interconnectivity of our local food system as we plan for actions that will move the needle toward equity. Similar to the dye contrast they inject during a diagnostic test, our team has been mapping out the sometimes hard to see connections between the range of forces shaping our food system. Our overarching goal is to identify tipping points that have the greatest chance for advancing nutrition equity, especially in historically redlined neighborhoods. As we all know, these areas in Cleveland, like in Central or Huff or St. Clair Superior and Buckeye Shaker neighborhoods, have decades of policy supported disinvestment that create the perfect setting for a virus like COVID-19 to wreak havoc. The changes needed to undo these injustices will require us to put on new glasses so we can see the complex web structuring environmental injustice. As we prepare for the future, we need to fully recognize that a focus on food alone will not result in a sustainable and equitable food system, just like a focus on testing alone will not result in equitable risk for a deadly pandemic. Results of our research on food systems change reveals that as we plan for the next 50 years, we need the political will and financial commitment and we need changes in mindsets and heart sets and the formation of trusting relationships to work for criminal justice reform just as hard as we work for, to provide emergency food assistance during times of need. And for anti-gentrification policies for residents to remain in their neighborhoods as new resources like grocers and parks are developed and for community organizing efforts to grow advocates for environmental justice who use their power to ignite policies needed for transformation. In late February, there was a Twitter conversation about analogies for injustices. And I really like analogies since they're often powerful teaching tools. One of my favorites was by Paul Gorski who defined himself as an author, activist and founder of Equity Literacy Institute. And his analogy stated, Grit is to structural racism as sunscreen is to climate change. And I'll say it again, 
Grit is to structural racism as sunscreen is to climate change. COVID-19 is a shock that reverberates throughout our food system. It will not be solved by simply rolling up our sleeves and working harder and grittier as we Clevelanders do so well, or by placement of Band-Aids on a failing system. My yoga teacher once told me a story of her daughter as she learned to ride a bike. Finally, after several weeks of trying at home, her daughter went to a friend's house and learned to ride. And when asked what worked this time, the young girl said to her mom, mom, you never told me to look ahead to where I want to go. Now is an opportunity to look ahead. The disruptions from COVID-19 weaken tried and true systems. And in so doing, they provide a chance to vision and then begin to implement a new plan for food supply chains that are good for people and the planet for employment options that put money in our pocketbooks so we can live fully, for agricultural policies that provide capacity for farmers and farm workers to reap their harvest, and for innovation among food store owners to pivot their systems for new ways of service and delivery that benefit all, including people receiving supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits or SNAP, who currently cannot use their benefits for online food purchasing. COVID-19 illuminates how a change in one area will have its impact in so many others. And it's highlighted that as intractable as things may seem, just like Mother Earth, we do in fact adapt. Imagine, we heard a Senator Brown say what he was doing 50 years ago. Well, imagine April 22nd, 2070 as a time when we celebrate the transformative power of a crisis that was used to ignite bold changes for environmental justice in Cleveland and beyond. We did this 50 years ago, and I look forward to joining with all of you as we bring this vision to life. Thank you so much, Darcy, for that presentation, and thank you to all of our speakers today. We'll now transition to the Q&A portion of this town hall. Um, I, as I've mentioned in the chat box, you can question in the Q&A portion. Uh, the, just hit on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to type in a question. Um, two things as uh, we uh, look into those questions and get started, uh, the first is that Leading up to this uh, event today, I made contact with the climate action team at Beachwood High School and a number of their members that joined us today. And I promised that I would let one of them ask the first question. And so uh, I am going to, to do that now. I also see that there are some questions uh, pertaining to Senator Brown. Senator Brown's schedule, unfortunately, did not permit himself to join uh, the Q&A time today. Uh, he regrets not being able to make it, but I will promise to pass along uh, the questions. Uh, I see the questions about the Green New Deal uh, to Senator Brown's office. I myself is, have visited his Cleveland offices to ask for his support of the Green New Deal. And so uh, I will make sure to pass those along. And if I can uh, give the, pass along the response to those of you who asked those questions, I will. So now moving to our first question uh, from Gregory Perryman, who is a student at Beachwood High School. We have, been gr we have seen growing solidarity around frontline workers over the course of this pandemic. In the movement for climate justice, frontline communities such as indigenous and people of color communities have long been raising the alarm. Over the course of this pandemic, what should we learn about translating solidarity around frontline populations into systemic change? One of you like to address that excellent question. Our um, hi, thanks for this great question. I think uh, you, you mentioned it twice in your uh, question, which is, uh, solidarity, uh, the recognition that uh, this is a working class struggle and that we are united as the working class uh, and that that encompasses. So because we are not going to have the power to bring 
transformative change uh, unless we unite as the working class. Uh, we have that power, but we need to uh, recognize that we cannot be organizing in silos around pipelines or racial justice or healthcare justice, and that the fate of all of us is intertwined, really, that this is a struggle against capital and labor and the ex various manifestations of the exploitation of labor. So this is one way to look at it. And so as we fight together, we can use these opportunities as teachable moments to bring, like we are today, of inner, how we are all connected together and the kind of power that we need need, uh, which is not necessarily in the ballot box, and it's not necessarily um, around any individual campaign, but these are organizing moments that we can use to build our power to bring transformational change. Great. Thank you, Michelle, for that answer. In the interest of time, I'm going to move us, kind of combine two questions from uh, what's been asked that will transition us into a closing call to action from Chad Stevens, who is joining us from the Sierra Club. So the, the questions I'm gonna highlight here as we transition to that final closing call to action are, how can we help as an individual? That was a question specifically addressed to Yvonka Hall. And then also um, what's another question asked by Russell, Buckby is what specific actions are planned in Cleveland to address the climate and Corona crisis? And so Ivanka, we'll let you answer that, uh, take the first stab at answering those questions and then we'll uh, have brief responses before uh, transitioning to chat. Well, one of the things that the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition did um, two weeks ago was we released a press um, release and we're actually gonna release one again tomorrow on the years of potential life loss. And then next week, on um, faith, funerals, and the mental health impact around this virus. And so I think that um, part of that is making sure that we're um, speaking the same language around the community and that we understand the issues that are going on in the community. Um, yesterday, I heard Dr. Action, Action say um, for people to only go to the store one time a week. And so when we're talking about poor people, um, that's really hard. Um, because you go to the store and when your dollar ends. So if your dollar ended today and you only had $20 and you have enough to get $20, $20 worth of food, then in a couple of days or tomorrow, you're going to need to go back to the doctor. I mean, go back to the store. And so I think that that's, um, you know, that we really have to work together to address how do we make sure that people have access to the things they need. Um, for my organization, um, if people want to volunteer, um, if they want to give, if they want to help put bags together or donate bags or, or donate things that people need because we actually drive things to people's homes to try to keep their, their, um, their imprint from being um, out at the store every day. So if we're giving you two weeks worth of provisions, then hopefully it's allowing your, yourself and your family to not be able to not put yourself at risk because now we're making sure that we bring in breakfast and lunch for every day for your children. Um, and so I think that more organizations can do some of the things that we're doing. Um, I've seen some kind of food um, soup kitchens kind of pop up where they're outside. But I think that that, that individuals um, looking at causes and looking at things that they're willing to give their time and talents to are going to be important for us um, um, to overcome these. This is, this is something that's new to us. But this has never happened um, during our lifetime. And so we have to make adjustments and make adjustments court accordingly. And so all of a sudden my organization became a food, a mini food bank um, for the community. And it's not because it's something that we wanted to do. It was something that we had to do. And so um, looking at the things, the needs in the community and then seeing where you can kind of to fit in. And um, like Michelle said earlier about we're all in this together. We're, this is a basket. So if a basket is well right, then it is very tight. And if you start pulling out the strands for the basket, you pull the basket apart. And so I think that this is our time for us to be woven tightly like that basket. Thank you, Ivanka, for that response. And now if anyone else, so uh, in one, if any of our other panelists wanna give a one sentence, what you can do now for action, uh, go for it. Um, and then we'll transition to a closing call to action from Chad Stevens.
And if you have, if you don't have one, just give me a thumbs up and we'll, we'll roll to Chad. Or if you want to. Chad, let's roll to you. Give us a closing call to action. I appreciate you all for your kind words and your understanding of this uh, time and uh, space that we happen to find ourselves. So just really quickly, um, everything that I've heard today really made me think of one poem. Uh, it could be done by uh, Edgar Alpert Guest. Um, uh, and it's just really the, the first stanza speaks to everything that we need to do in action. And it says, somebody said that it couldn't be done. Uh, but he with a chuckle replied that it maybe it couldn't be, but he would be the one who wouldn't say that it t that till he tried. So he buckled right in with the trace of a grin on his face. If he worried, he hit it. He started to sing as he tackled the thing that it couldn't be done, and he did it. Um, just that first stanza of of that uh, poem really speaks to what we need to do today. And that's something that many people said that we couldn't have done uh, 50 years ago and so, still say that it can't be done today and that share our stories. Um, the call to action today is I had a multiple um, faceted call to action, but really simply for um, for the necessity of today is to share our story of and thoughts of how we can do more within this time frame, and that could be uh, you can share it via social media. We have a simple hashtag um, Earth Day uh, CLE, capital CLE. Um, share it on your Facebook. Share it on your uh, uh, Twitter and uh, Instagrams. And for those of you that use Snapchat, uh, share it on there too. Um, share your story. Share your thoughts of what needs to be done and how you can do it. Um, that's the simplest ask that I can have. Um, you can be asking that of the Senator, you can be asking that of other elected officials, what could they do? And you can ask that of your friends and family, but you also need to share what you will do and how you can do it. Um, those simple things and sharing those stories um, are necessary in this time. I believe in the power of our message is within our stories and that's part of the reason why I'm saying share our stories. And we will be following this. Um, uh, the, I will have, I personally will be following this on my Twitter and my, uh, and my uh, social media access and the other organizations, especially the Ohio uh, Sierra Club, um, will be reposting and sharing the messages as well. Um, if you all want to get become more active in this, the opportunity is now. Um, the Northeast Ohio Black Coalition has a ton of opportunities. Um, the Sierra Club has a ton of opportunities. I definitely know that the UCC Church has opportunities for you. So um, we are willing to extend other opportunities to, for you to be able to get involved. And uh, when we send out the, uh, you know, I can send out more messages, but until then, share your stories. Let us be able to share what it is that we can do that others are saying that can't be done. They said that Cleveland wouldn't uh, have a clean lake, a clean river, and, you know, the river's getting cleaner uh, year by year. We, we've, we, we have uh, an opportunity for Cleveland to um, extend and really show that we are continuing to stem the tide here. So we thank you. We are grateful for each and every one of you that joined and we continue to push forward and press forward in this time. Thank you again. Terrific. Thank you so much, Chad. And thank you again to all of our panelists. I will put together uh, a link of the recording for today, along with online resources that have been discussed or cited or anything else that our panelists share with me, uh, action opportunities, 
I know uh, we've been working on an action opportunity uh, for the Cleveland area because that we know uh, dirty air is related to higher death rates for COVID-19 and Cleveland and the, the Northeast Ohio region has some of the nation's leading super polluters. And so there's a real need, need to take action on air pollution uh, in this region and in Cleveland. And so uh, we will share action links for addressing that. So thank you very much, everyone, to all of our panelists and for everybody who has joined us. Uh, we were delighted to have you with us, and we hope that we will stay connected one way or another in the struggle. Take care, everyone.